First matter is the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus William Henry Cosby Jr. Representing Mr. Cosby is Ms. Jennifer Bonjean. Representing the Commonwealth is Ms. Adrienne Jappy and Mr. Robert Fallon. Uh, good morning. Uh, in this case, the felon was convicted of aggra aggravated indecent assault uh, stemming from an incident that occurred in 2004. Uh, prior to trial, Pellant moved to dismiss the charges, uh, claiming that the prosecution had granted him immunity for criminal liability. The motion was denied. Uh, during trial, uh, the Commonwealth introduced five witnesses under evidentiary rule 404B to testify regarding their accusations of sexual assault against the Pellant for purposes of establishing appellant's common scheme or plan. Now, the issues before the court are whether, one, the testimony of the five witnesses regarding their respective accusations was admissible evidence under Rule 404. And secondly, whether there was a binding agreement between appellant and the Montgomery County District Attorney that would result in immunity from criminal prosecution. With that, uh, we'll proceed with the appellant. Good morning, and may it please the court. In our system of justice, a defendant must be tried for what he did and not who he is. And yet, the prosecution has made no secret of the fact that it intended to indict Mr. Cosby's entire life. After failing to secure a conviction after Mr. Cosby's first trial, the pros prosecution shifted strategy, laying waste to the presumption of innocence and telling the jury that Mr. Cosby's claim of defense could not be believed because, quote, he had done this so many times before. The prosecution forced Mr. Cosby to defend not only the charge defense, but five mini trials and vague accusations from countless Jane Doe's dating back to the 1970s. And while the public and the media were free to judge Mr. Cosby's guilt based on those factors, his criminal jury was not. And perhaps a limiting instruction served its purpose at Mr. Cosby's first trial, but there can be no confidence that it did its job at the second, where the jury was bombarded with prior bad act evidence. Indeed, half of the prosecution witnesses testified in connection with uncharged 404B allegations. Some of the allegations, the most damning ones, came from a deposition that should not have been admitted, admitted in the first instance on account of an agreement with the Montgomery County District Attorney not to prosecute Mr. Cosby, a promise on which he relied to his grave detriment. So they both from the Montgomery County did. As argued in our briefs, none of the prior bad act evidence served a legitimate non-propensity purpose. But that aside, consensus surely must be reached that Mr. Cosby suffered unquantifiable prejudice where the PBA evidence or the prior bad act evidence overwhelmed his second trial, converting it from a trial on a single offense to a trial of his character. And with that, I would entertain any questions from the court. Counsel, this is counsel, Justice Doherty speaking. Let me just zero in on the civil deposition. Even taking into consideration and finding is true that he, Mr. Cosby, your client, did not believe that he was to be prosecuted for the events involving um, Ms. Constance there. Tell me, when confronted with a question plausibly implicating criminal conduct in any deposition, an individual has an affirmative duty to invoke their Fifth Amendment regarding other issues or potential other criminal conduct. Why was that not done by counsel for Mr. Cosby and Mr. Cosby, Cosby himself? I think that speaks to the agreement, frankly, that the agreement not to prosecute was linked to the willingness to give a civil deposition, which we know this in part from looking at the press release, which demonstrated that not only did the uh, district attorney at the time, Bruce Castor, decline to prosecute, but he mentions in the press release that there was going to be ongoing civil lit litigation. So, and, and you also can look at Mr. Schmidt's testimony, who 
testify that it was our understanding, it was our belief that the promise not to prosecute would be honored so long as Mr. Cosby agreed to sit for this deposition and give testimony and not invoke his Fifth Amendment right, which he did, again, to his detriment. Uh, and in hindsight, of course, you we would have preferred to have seen a written agreement or something on the record that would have reflected that this was the arrangement that had been made. But I think the fact that Mr. Cosby actually sat, answered questions for four days, and I think it speaks to the court's point, that this is evidence in and of itself that he relied on this representation. No one would sit for a deposition and not invoke their Fifth Amendment right, guilty or innocent, if there was the possibility of criminal prosecution looming over your head. So the fact that he did is leads to the only reasonable inference that he believed that in order to not be prosecuted, this would be this was part of the agreement that he complied with. And as a result, uh, to the extent that the prosecution wanted to use the deposition testimony, um, once they decided to prosecute him, that deposition testimony should have been off the table at a minimum. A counsel, <clears throat> counsel yes. Justice Baer, uh, at the first trial, and I don't think it's in our record, but it is properly before us. Were there any, was there any prior bad act testimony? There was one prior bad act witness who testified at the first trial, correct. Uh, and of course, you didn't take an appeal because that was not a conviction. That's uh, right, Your Honor. Would, would, but I understand your argument. I tend to agree that this, this evidence was extraordinarily prejudicial to your client. But there's a trial court discretion component here. In your view, if the trial court had allowed one again, would that have been an abuse of discretion? Or if the trial court uh, allowed two? And where do we as an appellate court draw a line between abuse of discretion and, uh, and, and, and a discretionary call, which perhaps we would have not made, but which was not powerful, we don't have the power to overrule? Yes, understood, Your Honor. Our position is the trial court abused its discretion for two reasons. One, because not even one prior bad act witness uh, served a non-propensity purpose, but also because the admission of five prior bad act witnesses was uh, unduly prejudicial to the point that no limiting instruction could have cured it, and that these five discrete allegations from 15 to 22 years ago uh, had uh, such minimal probative value as compared to the danger of unfair prejudice that it, it seems clear that the court did not exercise discretion in allowing five. So I think it's twofold. Our position is that there was no theory of admissibility that was in, for a non-propensity purpose. But even if this court were to disagree with that, at the end of the day, five witnesses, plus all of this vague testimony about quaaludes and Jane Doe's that were just exploited to the hilt during the closing arguments that frankly were just contorted from the deposition testimony in the first place, put Mr. Cosby in a position where he had no shot. The presumption of innocence just didn't exist for him at that point. And so I think uh, the court abused its discretion in both of those ways. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, this is Justice Donahue. Uh, good morning. Good, good morning. Since you are not going to have time for a rebuttal, yes. um, I would like you to, um, uh, for me, um, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about why the evidence that was offered through these uh, prior bad act witnesses uh, did not go to establish a uh, common plan or scheme or a signature crime, which is what I understand uh, your reported use was. Yes, Your Honor. I um, So at the outset, I would say the common plan is in an apt theory of admissibility here for, for two reasons. One, because the prior bad act evidence was not part of a single overarching plan, which I think the prosecution concedes. It also was an apt because identity was not a disputed fact in this case. And the overwhelming authority from this Commonwealth and across the 
the country, is that signature-like prior bad acts, also known as modus operandi evidence, is relevant to prove identity. In fact, the test in this commonwealth is that it must be so nearly identical to be the handiwork of the same perpetrator. But when identity is not in dispute, the evidence simply registers with the jury as propensity evidence. To put it very simply, where identity is a dispute, a modus operandi may be perfectly proper. Where identity is not in dispute, it just amounts to propensity evidence. And make no mistake about it, that is what the prosecution is asking this court to do, is sanction propensity evidence. And simply because the prosecution can shoehorn prior bad act evidence into some exception, it does not make it admissible uh, since it may not bear on a matter at issue in the case. But with that said, if any members of the court disagree with that analysis, and, and, and that may be the case, even if this court believes that the signature crime approach is the appropriate approach to this case and a proper theory of admissibility, um, the prosecution still does not prevail here because the prior bad acts were general in nature insofar as they involved sexual misconduct of some type and the use of an intoxicant. They were not nearly identical as to the charged offense, at least any more nearly identical than they would be to, frankly, almost the majority of acquaintance assaults or date rape situations where we know that intoxicants almost invariably play a role in those types of assaults. But if you want to get more granular about it, in this case, we have prior allegations, again, 15, 22 years old prior allegations that involve um, uh, a number of distinctions from the charged offense. I think one of the most astounding ones is the nature of the relationship. You cannot compare the relationship that Mr. Cosby allegedly had with these five other women that he did with the complainant. Um, this was an 18 month relationship. This was a relationship that at least by her own testimony was built on friendship. They exchanged gifts. Uh, they spoke regularly. Um, this notion that he was mentoring her. Well, I mean, anybody who comes in contact with Bill Cosby is going to sort of, given, given who he is, could perceive that he would be a person who's wise and would be able to give you advice. But this is not the scenario where uh, he sought her out or she sought him out for some uh, to advance her acting career or a modeling career. This was a chance encounter. Uh, he brought her into his inner circle as a friend, introduced her to people he knew. Uh, he traveled uh, to places with her, where she, New York, Connecticut. Um, so the nature of this relationship was very different. In the five uh, prior bad act cases, um, one woman uh, you know, had not even been invited to Mr. Cosby's home. She just came with a friend and she was not an actress. And she didn't, you know, this was just, uh, you know, a woman that showed up to, to, to come socialize with Mr. Cosby with her friend. The other women had met him once or twice. Uh, so again, the nature of the relationship, I think, is a, a marked, marked difference between the prior bad acts. Um, we also have very different, different sexual type of contact. One of the women, Ms. Lublin, uh, testified that um, she doesn't recall any sexual contact other than some bizarre behavior where he allegedly stroked her hair. Um, and some women describe, you know, uh, intercourse where other women describe that there was something uh, that didn't involve penetration. So the sexual, sexual acts themselves were very different. The nature of the intoxicant was different. In some cases, like uh, Ms. Baker Kinney, she said, I took the qu quaalude. He offered a quaalude to me. I took it. There's no evidence whatsoever that anybody else uh, used was given a quaalude, um, even among the other four uh, prior bad act witnesses is in the charge defense. Uh, you know, for as much as quaaludes played a role in this case, uh, from the prosecution's perspective, it just... They're, they will concede. They have no evidence that Mr. Cosby gave Ms. Constant a quaalude or anybody else, frankly. The only person who speaks about a quaalude is Ms. Ms. Baker Kinney, who said he offered me one and I took one. Uh, so, so, yes, this is Justice Todd. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's assume we accept your argument on prior bad acts, that it was error to introduce it. 
Could you address the harmless error question? Could this possibly have been harmless error? It could not have been harmless error. And I think we need only look at the first trial to get our answer to that. It is clear that the prosecution wanted and needed propensity evidence, but they had no right to it. You don't get to make up for weaknesses in your case by bombarding each jury with rank propensity evidence. That's not fair. And frankly, the prosecution's case the evidence was ample. They didn't need this evidence. They had the complainant's testimony. They had corroboration. They even had an expert who was able to rehabilitate uh, the uh, any cross-examination. And with that, the first jury still could not reach a unanimous verdict. And as a result, I don't think that this is a case where there was overwhelming uh, evidence of guilt. Uh, and I think uh, we have the benefit of this first trial to tell us that. And yet the prejudice, again, was extraordinary uh, in this case. And no curative instruction uh, could have solved it. I think the Third Circuit uh, said it best um, when uh, it commented that when an evidence of this magnitude is presented to a jury, it is most difficult, if not impossible, to assume the continued integrity of the presumption of innocence. And to put it, yes. Yeah, so this is Justice Faculty Ted. Yes. Right, let me return to the civil deposition because I struggle. It appears that your argument is based upon promissory estoppel, correct? Correct. So again, when we're looking at the parties with regard to promissory estoppel and each individual factor, the concern that I have is here, as you indicated in your opening, they're trying to dissect or look at his entire life. And that being that I, I assume you're implying that he's a celebrity. And therefore, uh, this is even a harsher look at him. With that in mind, with that in mind, my concern is how are, how are we to accept one of the second prongs of promissory estoppel is justifiable reliance on the inducement. When we have to look at this individual, we're dealing with an individual who's knowledgeable of the legal system. He's in entertainment. It's not as if this is his first advancement or use of lawyers. So how is it when you take into consideration the inducement, AKA the Castor press release for which he signed indicating that Cosby would not be prosecuted for the instant matter of investigation. How is it that we're to just find justifiable reliance of an, intell in, 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 an individual who's intellectually, at least legally superior than the average person based upon his history, as you brought forth in your argument, to really rationalize that he justifiably relied upon refusing or uh, the DA's refusal to prosecute, yet provided additional elements of other individuals, not the focus of the initial criminal investigation, and yet affirmatively refused to invoke a Fifth Amendment. I'm struggling with your argument. And, and I understand that, Justice. I, I think I would disagree with one premise, which is that the assumption that, and with all, that's, with all due respect to Mr. Cosby, that he is um, particularly savvy about the law or that he has an understanding of these things. Um, I think high profile people often rely almost to their detriment on legal advice. Um, they have a lot of legal issues and they defer many times to their attorneys who tell them this is the deal. You know, you, 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 this is part of the agreement. You will not be prosecuted. Go sit down, cooperate. You cannot invoke your fifth amendment. Right. And, um, and he relied on that. And I think that this court's decision in Stipitich really helps guide us here because in that case, you had two defendants who uh, were arrested and even with the assistance of their counsel present, brokered a deal with a law enforcement officer who said, listen, if you tell us the source of this contraband, we won't prosecute you. And again, here are defendants. I don't know how savvy they were, but they were there with their attorney. And the attorney said, yes, go ahead and tell them that. And 
naturally, this court ultimately concluded that it's the district attorney's job to decide who prosecutes, not law enforcement officers. But the court still determined that that evidence should be suppressed because he relied on that. And as a matter of equitable uh, principles and fairness, um, I think that we would have to assume that there that that for Mr. Cosby, um, again, I, I don't think he should be punished because he followed the advice, believed there was a deal, and invoked his Fifth Amendment right. Again, in hindsight, we certainly would have all done this very differently. But I think the fact that he did sit and gave gave the testimony, the only fair inference is that he did rely on the representations um, and that it was done with the assistance of his attorney who testified. I understood through his criminal counsel and I understood from the criminal through the criminal counsel from the uh, the district attorney that this was connected. He had to testify in order to not be prosecuted. Counsel, and that's the way he can answer that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's Justice Barrett. I want to follow up on, on Justice Faraday and then I have an independent question. Uh, and I don't mean to nitpick, but there's nothing in my preparation that uh, that indicated that Mr. Cosby has ever indicated in his testimony or his protestations that he relied upon the alleged deal with uh, D.A. Castor uh, in the trial court. And I noted this because, again, it's a bothersome case that the trial court found Mr. Schmidt, who was his attorney Schmidt, who was attorney at that point, not credible, found that that um, uh, that his testimony was was not persuasive. I and you know, and I can't recall, but indicated that he negotiated a deal with the National Enquirer and 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 this settlement and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and just didn't believe that uh, he that that he had done this. And and again, uh, you know, the first question I asked you was trial court discretion. Here again, you you, you fall under the constraint of. Uh, trial court determination of credibility, which is binding on us. So doesn't that sort of get you to the wrong side of Justice uh, Doherty's question? Well, I think you are absolutely correct that this court owes great deference to the trial court's credibility findings. They are not, however, unassailable. And I believe that the dispositive facts in this case uh, the ones that are not disputed still lead us to the conclusion that at least the deposition must be suppressed. And those are that we know that Castor chose not to prosecute. We know that. Whether that promise was intended to bind future prosecutions, I suppose, is a, a credibility determination that that the court resolved against Mr. Castor. But we do know at that moment he declined to prosecute. He represented that in the press release and that it was bound to or linked. There was some nexus to the civil case. And um, again, I can't create a formal writing that didn't exist. It just didn't exist. And again, we can look in hindsight and wish it did. I think we all do. Uh, but I think the reason it's troublesome for us is that we can't wrap our head around the fact why would somebody sit for a deposition with prosecution looming over their head in such a serious matter? And I think while that may lead somebody to a different conclusion, for me, it leads to the conclusion that, well, clearly there must have been a understanding and a confidence that if he did so, there would not be a prosecution. And that is, I guess, the best way I can answer that question. I think that's that's fair. Let me ask you one last question. And I hope I'm done. Um, you you as part of your able presentation detailed the nature of the relationship between the defendant and the victim. And one of the exceptions in 404B is absence of mistake with specificity. Uh, why isn't it reasonable that the evidence of the um, prior bad acts comes in to show that Mr. Cosby was not mistaken, that this was a consensual relationship? Well, um I would point out that using absence of mistake to show some type of uh, mens rea, if you will, um, because that's what we're talking about, is um, unconventional, to say the least. There is, there's a dearth of authority in this commonwealth and elsewhere that absence of mistake is an exception that applies where the physical elements of the crime are not in dispute. You usually see it, of course, when a defendant says, well, you know, my conduct was an accident or it was a mistake. And... Um, 
Uh, that's sort of the traditional scenario. Here, the prosecution is using it really for a novel idea that it, it allows us to look into Mr. Cosby's mind and determine whether or not he uh, mis whether he could have mistakenly assessed her uh, ability to consent. And um, our position is, and, I, and if the court, I'm sure the court has read the briefs and will, uh, Professor M. Winkle re wrote an entire article about the use of prior bad act evidence for mens rea purposes and how it's really kind of a slippery slope because it's just fair, it's not as predictable, the mental component, just because someone exercised a particular intent five times before 15 years ago does not necessarily mean he exercised that same intent or was under the same uh, belief system. So it, it, so we'll say that. With that said, there is authority uh, from Commonwealth versus Tyson out of the Superior Court, which for the reasons we've addressed in our brief, we have said um, we believe is wrongly decided. But apart from that, um, it's our position that it is highly distinguishable because unlike the defendant in Tyson, Mr. Cosby had not been accused of those prior bad acts before the incident with Ms. Constant. So one of the focuses that the court had in the Tyson case was that there the defendant had been accused, he had lodged a consent defense, he had been prosecuted. So he certainly had knowledge. He suffered the penal consequences of his behavior before. And he was on notice that um, when he had this similar encounter that he should have known better. But here we have a very distinct scenario where Mr. Cosby was did not face any of these accusations prior to the charge defense. Uh, that it came after the charge defense. Moreover, we don't know whether Mr. Cosby would even allege consent as to those five prior acts. The record is silent on that. He could say, "I, I don't remember. I don't know who that woman is. Um, I never met that woman, or we never had any sexual relationships." The record is simply silent on that. So, um, I, I, I think to to sum up on this point, using. Um, uh, absence of mistake as an exception, or excuse me, to use uh, prior bad act evidence to show a mens rea uh, in this case, is which, which is what the prosecution is trying to do, it has a number of pitfalls that are identified by Professor M. Winkle Reed. It's just well, not uh, a uh, counsel, uh, Ms. Bongean, this is Tom Saylor. Uh, the professor concludes very tellingly that the trier of fact can reason from the starting point the uncharged crime to a conclusion about the mens rea of the charge only through an intermediate assumption about the accused character or propensity. That's right. a difficulty with this approach, isn't it? Yes, it is. And that that's is ably carried. The jury is going to have to make that leap. And uh, that's the, uh, the overtly... Uh, difficulty with applying this doctrine. That's absolutely right, um, that the jury has to make a intermediate determination about tendency or disposition that because he acted with an alleged mens rea in the past, uh, he had a tendency or disposition to do so on the charged offense. So in that sense, that is why, frankly, prior bad act evidence just doesn't really work very well when looking at mens rea types of issues, as opposed to Issues that involve physical acts, which are far more predictable. Now, could I ask you if uh, you could uh, sum up in a word or two as we're going to move to the uh, comment? Yes, Your Honor. Um, thank you very much. I would just point out that prosecuting agencies in this Commonwealth and states across the nation have, have chipped away at the general prohibition on prior bad act evidence uh, for, for decades. And with this case, they truly seek to obliterate it. Um, this court should rule to protect the time cherished rule, not just because it's Bill Cosby or to right a wrong in this case, but because the constitutional guarantees of the presumption of innocence, the burden of proof, and even due process that frame our criminal justice system are at stake. And I thank you all. Thank you. We'll hear now from the Commonwealth. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning, Chief Justice Saylor, Justices of the Supreme Court. 
May it please the court, Adrian Jaffe, on behalf of the Commonwealth, I will be arguing the prior bad act issue. My colleague, Deputy District Attorney Fallon, will be arguing the alleged non-prosecution agreement. Your Honor, the prior bad and act. Why is that? Is it? Is it uh, why do we need uh, two lawyers? Well, we filed a motion to split up the argument, and that motion was granted. So since yeah. I've been working on the prior bad act since the inception of this case, and Mr. Fallon has been working on the other issue, that's why we submitted our motion. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. The prior bad act evidence in this case, the defendant's drug-induced sexual assaults of five women, was relevant under three separate grounds. First, it was relevant under the absence of mistake exception under 404B to rebut a defense. In this case, the defense was consent. That is, it had a tendency to prove that the defendant was not mistaken about whether or not Andrea Constant was conscious enough to consent to any sexual contact. The evidence was also admissible under the common plan or scheme exception. The defendant engaged in a years-long signature predatory pattern of seeking out and intentionally isolating young women so he could intoxicate them for the ultimate purpose of sexually assaulting them. So his plan was to intoxicate young women to eliminate consent. And thirdly, Your Honor, I would submit Counsel, the evidence. Counsel, I apologize for interrupting you, but you keep saying the five women were sexually assaulted. It's my understanding that the last individual, the young woman that was interviewed for a part on the Cosby show, there's no allegations of sexual contact. It's that she took a medication, fell asleep and woke up. Yes, Your Honor. And so share with me, share with me, how can you represent that there was sexual abuse on that person when the record evidence indicates just the opposite? Your Honor, I would submit that the signature was isolating and intoxicating young women for the purpose of sexually assaulting them. And I would, Lisa Lott Loveland, you're correct, Your Honor. She did, in fact, testify that she has no recollection of being sexually assaulted. She has no recollection of what happened. After the defendant gave her a drink, she drank it. After the defendant asked her to sit in between his legs on the couch, which she deemed to be odd and inappropriate, and then he began stroking her hair. Then she basically passed out and was unconscious until she woke up two days later in her apartment. Um, but the bottom line is that the part of the signature is the entirety of the contact and the conduct between the defendant and these victims. And the Ms. Jaffe, uh, or... or uh, Tom Saylor, uh, but that conduct you described, the, the, the steps, the young women, that there's literature that says that's common to 50 percent of these assaults, thousands of assaults nationwide. Your Honor, it's it's the mentor mentee relationship. It's the fact that the defendant was built trust in his victims because of their mentoring relationship, because of well, I understand status. that. But you, you see, if that was the case, it would be. Maybe you dispute the literature, but in the briefs, they cite treaties and, and literature that says that's common to 40 or 50 percent of these assaults nationwide, the number in the thousands. Well, perhaps it is true that 50 percent of, of sexual assaults are drug induced sexual assaults. Well, how can that be a common scheme? You know, according to what's in the defendant's brief, there's been no evidence at trial as to any statistics. And I would submit that's not part of the trial record. So that shouldn't be considered by this court. But Your Honor, the defendant engaged in a pattern of seeking out young women. He met them through their employment or their career. He offered to mentor most of his victims. There was a built-in level of trust because of his status in the entertainment industry and because he held himself out as a public moralist. He was The victims were legitimately in the defendant's presence because he invited them to the location within his control under a guise and each incident occurred, again, in, an, in, a, in a location within the defendant's control. So he could intoxicate these people, carry out his plan without any interrupted discovery. And then he intoxicated them, waited until they were unconscious or otherwise unable to consent to any sexual assault, and then either sexually assaulted them or in the case of Lisa Lot Loveland, he engaged in untoward, I would, what I would submit as untoward sexual conduct, inviting a young woman to sit in between his legs and then starting to pet and stroke her hair. Counsel, this is Justice Donahue. What are you describing? A signature? A signature crime? Is that what you're, is that uh, what you're describing to us? 
Because Your Honor, I I am not. Let me let me just. I apologize. Asking the question, the assault that took place here, the alleged assault that took place here, took place in uh, the defendant's home after an eighteen month relationship with the uh, with Miss Constand. Uh, after uh, meeting her mother, after going on trips with her, um, I mean, you know, if you're talking about a signature, you better incorporate all of the facts that we have in the case that's on trial with what you are offering as a signature, because frankly, I don't see it. Your Honor, certain differences. Well, let me let me say this first. Miss Constan was not the only victim that the defendant had a lengthy relationship with. He had a several years long relationship with Lisa Lott Lublin. He had a relationship with Janice Dickinson. She had been to his apartment in New York prior to the assault and he sought to mentor her. He also had a relationship with Shalon Lasha. He had spoken to her grandmother on the phone. He had come over to Shalon Lasha's house for dinner. And he also had a relationship with, with Heidi Thomas. He spoke to her on the phone on numerous occasions. So it's not true that he only had a friendship or relationship with Andrea Constant. And in any event, Your Honor, the actual relationship is just one of many factors to take into consideration in making a determination as to whether or not something is a signature. There are certain distinguishing factors that are inconsequential to whether or not a crime is a signature or whether or not absence of mistake applies. That is, whether or not the defendant was mistaken in assessing Ms. Constance ability to consent to the sexual assault. And I would submit that the absence of mistake exception, which was the main exception that we proffer this evidence for, has a lesser lesser threshold of admissibility than does the common planner scheme. Whereas the common, well, the common planner scheme, admittedly, as is pointed out in several opinions from this court, and as the defense points out in his brief, there is, in fact, some conflation between um, in common plan or scheme, for instance, whether or not it's being admitted solely to show a common plan or whether or not it's being admitted for identity purposes. Can I jump in, counsel? Can I jump in on that uh, for sure. a moment? Uh, you've referred to an alleged signature aspect. Uh, I doesn't identity is not an issue here. So where are you going with this signature allegation? That's number one. And number two, with respect to your repeated argument about uh, absence of mistake, how does that factor in here when, when Cosby never argued that he made a mistake or that he made an accident or something like that? He argued consent. Can you answer those two questions for me? Sure, Your Honor. In terms of consent, I would submit that absence of mistake is routinely has been admitted in numerous cases or several cases in this commonwealth to demonstrate an absence of consent particular. And I would submit that was the defense here, an, an, an absence of consent. And numerous cases such as Commonwealth versus Tyson have allowed evidence to come in to show absence of mistake. And in that case, Commonwealth versus Tyson, there were, the defendant was on trial for rape of an unconscious person and a prior bad act of a rape of another unconscious person came in. And the Superior Court sitting in Bank found that that was, in fact, admissible to establish a lack of consent. And also another case, which was not cited in my brief, Commonwealth versus Kearsgaard, that was a 1990 Superior Court case. That was a situation in which a defendant was on trial for raping a teenager and evidence came in of a prior rape of a teenager to um, to to came in for absence of mistake to show that he was not mistaken as to whether or not the victim consented. So there are cases in this Commonwealth that allow for absence of mistake to show a lack of consent. And in, in any event, Your Honor, admitting other act evidence to rebut a defense is a staple in Pennsylvania jurisprudence. And the effectiveness of the rebuttal here is enhanced by a distinct pattern of similar crimes indicative of the common conscious design here. For instance, in Commonwealth versus Boskowski, that was an opinion of this court. It was a bathtub drowning case. Um, the defendant was on trial for the murder of his wife. And incidentally, his prior wife died the same way in a bathtub drowning. And in that case, the court found that the evidence was admissible of the prior wife's drowning to under the absence of mistake exception to rebut the, 
to rebut the defendant's contention that the act was the result of a deliberate act. And in Commonwealth versus Hicks, Your Honor, as well, the prior bad, that was a homicide case, which I'm sure this court was aware of. It was just a few years ago. And in that case, one of the reasons why the prior bad act evidence it came in regarding three prior assaults was for absence of mistake to show that the, the victim in that case didn't die of simply a drug overdose, but rather it was a deliberate act of the defendant. So what we're doing here in proffering this prior bad act evidence to show an absence of mistake is nothing different that has been done in this court in numerous occasions to rebut a defense that's being proffered in this case. But, but counsel, back to Justice Weck's question, uh, the defendant here didn't claim that he made a mistake in uh, uh, thinking that there was consent. That's an editor by the Commonwealth in order to create a basis to assert this evidence. Well, Your Honor, I, I disagree because perhaps it's just a matter of semantics, but the defendant was claiming consent. That was yeah. the defense. So right. by implication, he's saying he was perhaps mistaken in assessing her ability to consent. So I would submit that it would be the same thing. He wasn't asserting that at all. I mean, he was asserting consent. In order to proffer this evidence, the Commonwealth twisted that defense into, oh, now we're going to prove that there wasn't a mistake about the consent. They're, they're really two totally different propositions. Well, with all due respect, Your Honor, I, I don't see them as being different. However, also, the evidence was also admissible under absence of mistake to show that Andrea Constant was not conscious enough to consent. Let me ask you this, counsel, before before we get much uh, deeper into this. Why did you need this evidence? You had a um, you, you had the complainant who was capable of testifying, who did testify. And the question in this case was, who is the jury going to believe the complainant who did testify or the defendant, uh, you know, who had a different version of what occurred here. Why did you need prior bad acts evidence at all? Your Honor, it was needed for several reasons. Number one, it was needed to corroborate the victim's testimony that she did not consent. In order to convict the defendant of aggravated indecent assault, the defendant had, or excuse me, the Commonwealth had to prove that the defendant engaged in non-consensual penetration of Andrea Constant's vagina. Thus, as I indicated, the main issue became one of consent. Without this evidence, the Commonwealth would have had to largely rely on the uncorroborated testimony of Andrea Constant regarding the lack of consent. And Tyson made clear that this case or this exact <coughs> scenario created a heightened need, noting that if the evidence in that case was excluded, the Commonwealth would have to rely solely on the uncorroborated testimony of the victim to counter the defense consent of consent. Now, I will say there was other corroboration of Andrea Constant's testimony, but in terms of consent, there was no other corroboration of her testimony. And in addition, Your Honor, the victim- Ms. Jaffe, uh, excuse me, but you really, I think, you focus on the fact, the lack of consent on the part of the victim, but you're really trying to demonstrate appellant's knowledge of that lack of consent. And that was the argument of the uh, appellant, don't you see, when you use that, uh, that doctrine, uh, absence of mistake, it, you know, you want to you want to inject that before the jury to show that the defendant lacked knowledge of the lack of the victim's consent. And I come back again to the to the problem with that type of testimony. Uh, legally and within the literature, that's going to require a jury inference into the appellant's mens rea, which is really what you're focused on. What did the defendant, what was the defendant's state of mind? And I'll read you again that they, the trier of fact can reason from the starting point of the uncharged crime to a conclusion about the mens rea of the charged crime only through an intermediate assumption 
about the accused character or propensity. And, and that's the, the legal issue uh, that confronts this court in terms of the, uh, the uh, sanctity of the verdict. Well, Your Honor, I don't think that's an inference that needs to be taken or adopted because the whole absence of mistake, it's coming in to show the lack of consent. And the consent no, it's coming is- in to show the mens rea of the defendant with Your respect Honor, to lack of consent. I would submit that it's coming in to establish the actus reus because part of the aggravated indecent assault the actus reus of it is not just the digital penetration, but it's the digital penetration without the victim's consent. That's part of the actus reus. And to bring in absence of mistake, I would submit it's simply demonstrating that Ms. Constan was not consenting or could not consent because of the intoxicants that were provided to her. Ms. Jaffe, it's Justice Todd. Um, you referred to, when you were discussing the prior bad acts, I thought I heard you refer refer to them as prior crimes. Did you do so? Um, I don't know if, if I did. It was inadvertent. And I generally say prior bad acts because, and I'm well aware of the rules. It doesn't have to be a conviction in order to be a prior bad act. It can be crimes or other acts. And in this case, there are other acts. I've made no, if I did make an assertion that it was a crime, I it was inadvertent and I apologize. That's all right. Um, but I will say okay. that there does obviously there doesn't need to be a conviction prior bad acts to come in as the title of 404 B makes clear other yeah. acts are sufficient. I understand that, but um, did any of these prior victims um, report, prosecute, or go to court in any way over the incidents? None of them. None of them went to court anyway. In terms of reporting, they did not report the incidents to the authorities. Um, for many years afterwards. However, some of them, many of them did in fact report them to some people. For instance, Chalan Lasha, she was the 17-year-old that the defendant intoxicated and sexually assaulted in a hotel room. Immediately afterwards, she drove to her guidance counselor and told her guidance counselor what happened. Janet Dickinson, she confronted the defendant the next day, actually, and basically said, what the heck did you do to me? And then after that, she, she, in addition, she told like her publicist, and other, she was an actress, she told other people, including Dr. Drew Pinsky, when she was on Celebrity Rehab Show with him. This was a couple years after the incident, well, well before the Andrea Constant incident. So she told him, she told her publisher when she wrote a memoir, and in fact, she wanted to include it in her book. However, after speaking with the legal team, they said, no, we can't put this, that he sexually, he raped you and intoxicated you. And that was years and years before the assault came out. Um, several of the other prior bad act witnesses, when they, one of them, when they went home, they told their roommate, another one told their sister. But in terms of reporting it to the authorities, no. And as Dr. Ziv testified, she was our um, the sexual assault victim behavior expert. A lot of times these people don't report right away. And she explained all these rape myths that the defendant sought to debunk in its cross-examination of Andrea Constance. So she explained why they don't report these things to the authorities. Who's going to believe me? I'm saying Bill Cosby assaulted, sexually assaulted me after intoxicating me. So that's why they didn't go to the authorities. Counsel, share with me your position of the use of prior bad acts dating back as far as 37 years ago to 1984 with Heidi Thomas and how that is probative of current. Okay. Um, first of all, Your Honor, I do want to clarify something. I know you're saying 37 years back, but the time is from the time of the incident to the time of the Andrea Constant assault, mm -hmm. not the time of trial. So they were actually... The first assault that we introduced was in 1982. The assault on Andrea Constan was in 2004. Mm -hmm. So it was 14 to 21 years. And that's just, I know the defendant says 15 to 20, 25, 15 to 22 years in its brief. But the assault on Andrea Constan occurred in January of 2004. So you don't count January. So I will answer your question, but in terms of 14 to 24 years. Um, first, I want to point out that there is no bright line for what constitutes remoteness. Um, the determination should be made on a case-by-case -case basis based on the unique facts and circumstances of each case. There has never been a case that unequivocally says 
10 years is too long, 20 years is too long, because you have to consider the facts of each case. And focusing solely on the time lapse is improper because remoteness is only a single factor the court is to consider. And importantly, the, the remoteness or the time period is inversely proportional to the number of similarities between the incidents. And here there are abundant similarities. As I detailed, and I won't be happy to detail them again, but they are set forth in my brief. And I also want to point out that numerous cases have allowed in prior bad acts for the time frame around the same time as this case. For instance, in Commonwealth versus Luktish, that was a superior court case, the court allowed in 19-year-old sex assaults. And they were sex assaults going from 19 to 14 years before the current assault. And in that case, the court also let in another sexual assault eight, eight years before that. And Commonwealth... Counsel, I, I apologize. I understand the case. I understand. I guess the question or concern that I have in Pennsylvania jurisprudence, what you're advocating is that a three decades of an, an alleged prior bad act is admissible in a trial because there's no ceiling as to the staleness or remoteness. Yet we have to balance that against our own rule of 609 of evidence in which the use of a conviction is considered stale in the impeachment of a witness, unless there's the other argument, unless it's more probative of. So how is it that we are to digest the use of an alleged act is admissible 14 to 37 years later, yet we don't look as a trial lawyer and as a trial judge, I'm sure you've as a trial lawyer, have been exposed that when you try to introduce a stale conviction, it's objected to and usually sustained. How is it that what you're really asking us to do is to place a, an alleged prior bad act in being a superior position in its introduction into a trial as opposed to a conviction? I'm really struggling with that position. Okay, and I'd be happy to answer that. But I first want to say I, I would disagree that it's routinely um, not allowed in if it's over 10 years old. And a case in point was in this case, one of our prior bad act victims had a prior conviction that was over 10 years, and that was allowed in by the tri trial court. But in any event, the distinction, I would say, in this case is in your example, we're talking about a single, a single conviction. Here we have a recurring sequence of events. And that's why it's important when you're considering remoteness, you don't consider simply the one prior bad act in isolation and only in relation to Andrea Constant. The case law makes clear that you must consider them all in relation to each other. So in this case, the, the ones that were introduced, we had two in 1982, one in 1984, one in 1986, and one in 1989. And Again, I want to stress that you don't look at these in isolation, and this shows that there was a recurring sequence of acts by the defendant over a continuous span of time, as opposed to random and remote acts, such as, in your example, a random and remote conviction for 10 or 20 years. So while we have the 14 to 21 year gap, when the court had this evidence to consider, the gaps were less than 14 to 21 years because we proffered 19 witnesses. And when the court made his determination as to whether or not this evidence was relevant, the court had all 19 of those witnesses to consider. So he had the time frames of all those witnesses that closed up some of the gaps to more sufficiently demonstrate this recurring pattern or this recurring sequence of events of the defendant isolating, intoxicating, and then sexually assaulting young women. Counsel, that lead, that segues me into a, one additional question. Sure. Let's talk about that. It is, uh, my understanding of the facts of this case was that the, the judge, Judge O'Neill, permitted the Commonwealth out of those 19 witnesses to choose any five and introduce them, correct? No, that's not correct, Your Honor. The court allowed the Commonwealth to choose five out of eight. So we had okay. one to 19 listed in chronological order, 19 the closest to Andrea Constance's assault. He said we could choose any five from number 12 through 19. Counsel. While he said that, he also stated that he believed the evidence was all relevant. All 19 of them were relevant. But in only letting us bring in five, 
he was weighing the probative value of this evidence against any potential for unfair prejudice. Counsel, Justice Baer, and, and again, I'm just trying to follow up. Most of the argument today has been whether or not this evidence falls under 404B and is admissible at all. But uh, I think I started this argument uh, an hour ago by asking the, the, your, your, your worthy opponent about abuse of discretion. And, and I'm still there to some extent. Did you, you advocated putting all 19 in, is that correct? Oh, I lost you. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I can't hear you now. You advocated putting all 19 in. We did. All right. A hundred, fifty. Is there any any point at which we're not trying whether or not the defendant uh, assaulted the victim, but rather trying whether the the defendant assaulted one of the other 19 or 18 or Five. I, I re- and again, I recognize abuse of discretion is a broad standard, but you can still get to the point with evidence that's terribly probative that it's just too much and that this defendant did not have a fair trial. Well, Your Honor, again, like the window, it's admit- admissible, but but the amount of it is such that the weight was uh, conflated the issue from whether this defendant did this crime to uh, whether he did the other five or 18 or 19. Well, Your Honor, in addition to the judge only allowing us to present five, the court kind of acted as a gatekeeper during trial. Um, at, after the first prior bad act witness, the Commonwealth, or excuse me, the defense moved to preclude that, or to strike that testimony. And then she moved to preclude the next testimony. So the court was essentially revisiting the ruling. To, and he said on the record, you're allowed to have up to five. So it, he made the determination what was un, what would have been unfairly prejudicial or prejudicial or what was too cumulative. And that's what the trial court, the job of the trial court to exercise his discretion and do that. And importantly, there's no right line rule that four prior bad acts are, are too much or five or six. It depends on the facts and circumstances of each case. And there have been several cases in this Commonwealth that have allowed in more prior bad acts. For instance, in Commonwealth versus Frank, a superior court case, which I cited in my brief, a therapist was um, on trial for assaulting a young boy, sexually assaulting a young boy, and the court allowed in six prior bad acts to establish a common plan or scheme. And then in Commonwealth versus Arrington, which was a case from this court from a few years ago, Justice Baer, I know you wrote the opinion, and Justice Todd, you joined in the majority opinion. In that case, that was a homicide case, and the court allowed in prior bad acts from two um, previous girlfriends, and then some prior bad acts from a man. But each of those girlfriends testified as to multiple instances of abuse, and the man testified as to several instances of abuse. So I believe about 12 instances of abuse came in. So although in that case, there were only three witnesses taking the stand, there was about a dozen separate instances that were described. And the same with Commonwealth versus Lucktish and O'Brien, what I cite in my brief, sex assault cases. In them, only, I think, two prior sex assault victims came in. However, they testified as to numerous assaults that were committed on them by the defendant. Here, we only had five prior bad act victims. And while the defense says the prior bad act victims took up half of the testimony, that is not true. There were 25 witnesses that testified at trial over the course of 10 days. We had five prior bad act witnesses That's it, aside from two corroborative witnesses that took the stand for about three minutes each. That was two days of a 10-day trial. Ms. Jaffe, uh, we're going to hear now from your colleague, Mr. Fallon, because we want to conclude this argument, which is... uh, going on for a while. Your Honor, if I might just take two minutes to address harmless error very quick, because I know that was brought up. Yeah. If I may... It's our position, Your Honor, that even if for some reason this court finds that the evidence, the prior bad act evidence was not admissible, I would submit that any error was harmless in light of the overwhelming evidence. We had Andrea Constant's testimony that the defendant provided her intoxicants, that those pills rendered her incapable of consenting, that she was incapacitated, that the defendant penetrated her vagina with with his fingers. He put her hand on his penis and masturbated himself. And he fondled her breasts. If that's true, why'd you need the five witnesses? 
Well, Your Honor, there's a difference. This was our pretrial assessment of the case. We did not know at the time exactly how our evidence was going to go in. And while we said we needed this evidence, we met, in saying that the evidence was very important to us because the victim didn't promptly report, because we knew from everything that the defense did first time around and leading up to the trial that they were going to relentlessly and ruthlessly attack her credibility. And in fact, they did. And we also knew that they were going to call Margot Jackson, who was their separate that, witness. That has nothing to do with uh, harmless error. So we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Fallon. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. Thank you for allowing us to split time. Um, may it please the court, my name is Bob Fallon from the Montgomery County DA's office. I'll be addressing defendant's non-prosecution claim. Uh, he alleges that Bruce Castor in 2005 promised him transactional immunity and that he relied on that when deciding to sit and answer questions at a civil deposition. The trial court, however, after two hearings and hearing from the witnesses, found that there was no promise and that there was therefore nothing for defendant to rely upon when sitting for those depositions. Those findings and credibility determinations are supported by the record. That leaves this court, I'd submit, uh, with no mixed questions of law or questions of law to answer. Uh, it is simply, the court does not have to reach the issues of promissory estoppel or any of the other uh, legal or mixed questions that the defendant raises. Counsel, could event, I ask you? Could I ask you, counsel? Pardon me on that. Uh, assuming, assuming for the sake of argument that uh, you're right about there being no binding agreement, uh, there there would, under any circumstance, not be any argument about the prosecutorial exercise of discretion here. That is to say as memorialized in Mr. Castor's press release that a decision was made by the DA's office not to prosecute this defendant. Uh, since we're the Supreme Court, this, this uh, case obviously has implications well beyond this defendant. Uh, what is the lesson that emerges from your position in this case regarding the reliability of prosecutorial decisions? Uh, what is the implication for the thousands of promises made by prosecutors across the Commonwealth uh, every day or every week? Uh, uh, plea deals, uh, immunity agreements, uh, non-pros agreements, ag agreements to cooperate with witnesses, et cetera, in return for something, et cetera. Um, if, if your office's word is not its bond, uh, and we validate your position here. What is the lesson that emerges uh, from beyond this case for all cases going forward in Pennsylvania? Do you understand my question? I do, Your Honor. And th the fact is prosecutors are bound by contracts that they enter into, or if they do make a statement uh, that a defendant reasonably relies upon, then the defendant can seek some relief. The question here is, does it really reach that issue? because the only thing the defendant can point to is a press release that says that the prosecutor is not going to press charges. That same press release leaves open the possibility that if the case will be reconsidered. In this press release, District Attorney says, or District Attorney Kasser says, cautions all parties to this matter that he will reconsider this decision should the need arise. Not only that, but in 2015, he was interviewed by the inquirer and he told the inquirer. I put in there, referring to the press release, that if any evidence surfaced that was admissible, then I would revisit the issue. And that is evidently what the DA is doing. So I think the lesson that this case would teach is that simply because a prosecutor announces he, is, he or she is not going to press charges in a case, without more, that does not give the defendant license to say, wow, that's transactional immunity. It's really prosecutor 101 that you do not close off uh, cases, even, even if they go cold. You leave open the possibility that if new evidence is discovered, that you can then go back and live to fight another day in court. There is no reason for a prosecutor to just say, OK, I'm not going to press charges. Uh, defendants free and clear forever, no matter what turns up in the future. 
And no matter if a, a federal judge, as in this case, released a civil deposition and in an opinion said, this deposition reveals uh, behavior that is perhaps criminal. Uh, you, prosecutors should not and do not do that. They, they sometimes don't press charges in a case, but they never, in my experience, will just for the sake of a civil case, say we are never going to do that. And especially strange in this case, because Castor ended this investigation while the investigation team was still strategizing on the next steps. And that's from uh, Detective Richard Schaefer's testimony at trial. He said when he got the call that the case was closed, he and his team were still mapping out the next steps in the investigation. So that's a call. That's a call. Just one, just one brief follow up. Can I just have one brief follow up on my question? A sitting DA made a decision memorialized in a press release. You, you don't like that, uh, you being the successor's office, that is. Um, but why does that not bind you as the successor office? Your Honor, I think because by its own terms, it's leaving open the possibility that it can be reconsidered. I mean, it's right in the press release. And there's no, there can be certainly, a, the court was talking about reasonable reliance if we get to that analysis, if we're just talking about the, the strictly the press release, nobody should reasonably rely upon that for transactional immunity. That would be a horrible precedent to set, uh, to say that when the, the actual document says the prosecutor may reconsider it, that defendant can take that press release and say, I am forever immune. And then a court is later going to uh, enforce that. That is not that is not fair. That is not fair to the Commonwealth. And it's unreasonable for defendants to expect that. If they Mr. are, Todd. yes. All right, it's Justice Todd. Um, isn't it fair also to look at Mr. Cosby's re reasonable reliance on the agreement he believed he had um, based upon the fact that he went forward with the civil deposition and, uh, you know, put himself out there for those questions and did not, um, did not raise any objection at that time? or invoke his right to remain silent. Isn't that indicia of reliance on what he believed to be an agreement? Well, Your Honor, it, it is not. And uh, I'd also just point out that the trial court did not believe that it was indicia of reliance. And that's really the key issue here, whether the trial court uh, had support in the record for its findings. And I'll explain why it's not indicia of reliance on this uh, so-called promise from Castor. Uh, defendant sat for a police interview with multiple detectives during the investigation, and he gave an exculpatory account of his interactions with Andrea Constant. He did not invoke his Fifth Amendment rights, and his lawyer, Schmidt, who the court deemed uh, rejected his testimony, but Schmidt said that he had interviewed defendant before the detective interview, and he felt confident that the defendant would not incriminate himself. That's why Schmidt let him sit for the interview, because it served his client's interests. The defendant was able to get through that interview and end up uh, giving an exculpatory account. Not only that, but he then, with Schmidt negotiating the deal in detail, in writing, in multiple stages and exchanging of papers with the National Enquirer lawyers, negotiated for the defendant to sit down with the National Enquirer after the investigation and talk about Andrea and the whole incident. Again, he did not invoke his Fifth Amendment rights. The, the defense team, which was consisted of John Schmidt, Patrick O'Connor, uh, and Walter Phillips. I mean, as we talk about an excellent defense team, they, they let him sit because it served their best interests. And so if he had invoked his Fifth Amendment rights at the civil deposition, he would have faced negative consequences. And in fact, the victim's civil attorneys, uh, Troiani and Kivitz, they both testified we, we wanted him to invoke. It would have been better for our case because, one, the jury would have only have heard from Andrea, and two, we would have had a favorable instruction that would have allowed the jury to infer that because the defendant invoked his Fifth Amendment rights, his testimony would be unfavorable. So defendant at, sat for the civil depositions, tried to give an exculpatory account, and essentially did, although he slipped up and, and made statements that came back to haunt him, but he was trying to do exactly what he had done before. He sat for the interview with detectives, with the National Enquirer. He thought he could get away with it. His defense team thought he could get away with it. He was trying to avoid negative consequences of invoking the fifth in this situation, uh, and it backfired on him. That's what happened. There was no, uh, you know, and, and one important point, 
and I think Justice Doherty uh, mentioned, mentioned it earlier, the defendant, by his own allegations, believed he had transactional immunity from Castor for Andrea Constant. That's it. No other victims. Yet at the deposition, he would not answer a lot of questions about Andrea. You know, that's not consistent with someone unburdened uh, by transactional immunity. He was compelled to do so by the federal judge. And yet, and importantly, and this has never gone rebutted by the defense or even explained, is that defendant openly answered questions about other victims in other jurisdictions. Those victims would not have had any, he would have not had any immunity for those victims. Castor could not grant immunity for victims in California or New York or Las Vegas. Uh, so why would he, why, why explain that conduct? It's inexplainable if he sat because he had thought he had transactional immunity for Andrea Constant. So I don't think there was any actual reliance here. And that, that is, in fact, what the trial court found. And, and I want to be considerate of this court's time, uh, but just uh, in closing, I'd, I'd, I'd say ask the court to, you know, this court has established the deferential standard of review for credibility determinations and fact findings for a reason. Uh, the, a cold record does not capture everything that transpires in a courtroom, uh, from the mannerisms, tone of voice, gestures, expressions, the change in demeanor as a, as a cross-examination ch shifts from the beginning to the end, all these things aren't captured in the cold record. And as someone who was there that day, those both those days, I can I can sa safely say that this old record does not capture everything that happened. But even despite that, if you read this record, there's ample support for the trial court's fa fact findings and credibility determinations. And that's really as far as this court, I, I would respectfully submit, has to go. This is this is an issue for the trial judge. And he, he properly resolved and denied this claim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fallon. Uh, unless there are any other questions, we'll conclude this argument. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Your Honors. Take a five-minute recess and call the next case. This is a vendetta that Andrea's mother has. And Andrea's mother is using Andrea to do the worst things than you can ever imagine. Bill Cosby leaving the courthouse waves his cane to those shouting his name. His defense team on Friday intended to use this man, Robert Russell, to bring out the ghosts in Andrea Constance's past. Robert Russell should be allowed to say that Andrea Constance was not living a holistic lifestyle, that he did drugs with Andrea Constant and also her mother, Gianna Constant. Russell would say Constant had a history of drug use that was extensive, and he thought she was addicted to hallucinogenic mushrooms. Judge Stephen O'Neill wouldn't allow it. I'd like to know who Ms. Allred's clients were 40 years ago. What were their morals? What was their behavior like? Why did they approach Mr. Cosby? What did they want to get out of the relationship? This is 40 years later, and suddenly they're all coming out, making these accusations. Something seems wrong to me. They realize that they burned through the money, and they're coming after more. The comic icon facing the possibility of a 10-year prison sentence if convicted. There was a common plan that was hatched to extort Mrs. Mr. Cosby. They had it already in motion. Mrs. Constan already had it in motion. Maybe Ms. Constan didn't know about it. Because I don't believe Bill Cosby molested Andrea Constant. I didn't want to get slammed by the judge, okay? He's like, I want to do everything respectful. I wanted to make sure that, you know, it's like I was coming out with the facts, okay? And this is my life with Andrea Constant. I met Andrea Constant in, uh, at the Nike store. She invited me over to her house. Uh, she wanted me to meet her family. Okay, so when I got to the house and I met her mother, Joanne, so I asked Andrea, I says, Andrea, I says, uh, you know, we're having a lot of great conversations. Uh, your mother seems to like me a lot and, and I'm starting to feel emotionally attracted to you. And I said, Andrea, I says, uh, how do you feel about me? And she says, I feel pretty strong about you too. And, you know, I here and there, I would touch her, she would touch me. And that, that kind of emotional bond was starting to happen. This is where I got that tattoo from. Okay, because Andrea, on both of her wrists, she has a tattoo. 
it's about half the size of this tattoo. So I said, Andrea, I love the tattoos that you have on the inside of your wrist. I'll get one myself, okay? So together we went to the tattoo parlor. We got a tattoo. Andrea's mother asked me to sort of spy on her daughter, to tell me what she's doing throughout the day. So when that happened, I gave a call to her mother. Joanne hated tattoos on her body because it said it made her look like a man, okay? It made her look rough and she's not gonna have a life just because of those tattoos. She said that my mother came in the bathroom when I was cleaning myself and she saw the, she saw the, the patch on the, back of my, uh, on the back of my neck. And so Andrea says it was a tattoo and she was fuming. She had a big fight with Andrea. Her father was um, always thought that Andrea was gonna come into stardom. So he was playing around with some photos and made a photo of, um, of Andrea playing basketball in her time of playing basketball. And, um, and that was all framed and you know, when you look at it, she looked like a superstar. And her father was putting so much pressure on Joanne because Andrea didn't have any career goal set. And this is another thing that uh, became a big mystery to me when I found out that she was a massage. She's uh, going to school to be a massage therapist. That was the number one thing that she didn't want to do because her father, her father was a massage therapist and it's the last thing that Andrea wanted to do. You know, there was a time where Andrea and I, we went into a, we went for a drive and um, Andrea asked me if I would uh, uh, be willing to smoke pot with her. And I said, excuse me? And I says, uh, you know, I haven't smoked pot for a long time. And she said, and I says, Andrea, I said, you smoke pot? And she says, yeah. I says, I have a, a joint right here and I'm gonna light it up. And you know, if you want to drag, you take your drag. If you don't want to drag, I'm gonna smoke it. And so I said, okay, fine. You know, finally, when I got to know that she was, uh, uh, extremely excited every time that magic mushrooms was, you know, she talked about it. It's just, uh, she loved magic mushrooms. It was her, her number one drug. And then when time was going by, and then when the pot came out and talking about all the other different chemicals, and when the mushrooms came out, and when the liquor came out, I got extremely confused. I'm sort of like saying, where is this all coming from? I says, it's like I'm, I'm meeting two different people now. Uh, Andrea went in, I think uh, she went to sleep and, Andrea, uh, and Andy wasn't around. And uh, Joanne, you know, she said, oh, let's go sit outside. So we sat outside on the little porch that she, she had. And um, Andrea's mother comes back to me and she says, look, look, look what I found. So what's that? She says, I found a roach. And I says, uh, I said, Joanne, you want, you want me to uh, smoke uh, a little with you? And she says, yeah, why not? Would you finish it a little bit. It's not much. We can get a couple of tokes each, right? So I said, sure, okay. Uh, so I took one toke, and then I passed the roach over to her. And then uh, I says, Joanne, I don't want to do this. Andrea's uh, brother-in-law, okay, was a police officer. And as far as I know, uh, Andrea told me that he was an undercover, uh, undercover police officer. Uh, officer. I knew that her brother-in-law smoked uh, pot because Andrea would come up to me and she uh, she would tell me that yeah because of his work he would have to smoke pot and so you know I always felt that that was one of the resources where Andrea would get her uh, pot from. How I got to know Stuart is that uh, where I first got a, a good taste of Stuart is because uh, Stuart's wife, Diana, she had a birthday and Andrea invited me over to the, to the house to meet Stuart. When I went there, the first uh, big disappointment was, um, first big disappointment is that they were expecting Steve Nash to be there instead of me. Andrea knew uh, Steve Nash, okay? And uh, so the way that Andrea was expressing is that she was uh, very close to Steve Nash. The mother really was um, discouraged totally when Steve Nash had a picture with another woman. And so Steve Nash actually pushed Andrea out and the mother, uh, Joanne, she, uh, she called this, look at this picture, it's like a picture of a bimbo. The mother had high hopes that Andrea was gonna be 
connected to this, this uh, connected to Steve Nash. Um, and then when she saw this picture, it seems like all the hopes just slipped away. I got to figure out is like, is she attracted to me? Uh, or uh, does she feel the same way towards me? So I said, Andrea, I says, you know, I would like to, um, uh, after we have a workout, why don't we sit down and we have a conversation? And uh, she said, sure. So I asked Andrea, I says, Andrea, I says, uh, you know, we're having a lot of great conversations. Uh, your mother seems to like me a lot, and, and I'm starting to feel emotionally attracted to you. And so, um, but she says, like, uh, but I'm, um, I'm gay. And I said, okay. I didn't know how to respond, and when she told me that she was gay, I said, Andrea, I says, okay, so then it's best for us to, to separate. Andrea decided she didn't want to separate, but I was willing to uh, step out. Why did I stop talking to her? Because I couldn't handle, you know, wheeling me in, thinking that there's going to be a relationship here, that there's going to be a future here, and then pushing me out and realize that there's nothing going on. Permission and rejection, because I went through that for such a long time with Andrea. And that was destroying me. It was sucking the life out of me. When I left the house, um, I didn't want to see Andrea. I didn't want to talk to Andrea. And, you know, four o'clock came around and um, I go to my answer machine. There's like, there's in between 10 and 15 calls, okay? And I listened to each call. Each call uh, was Andrea. Andrea would say, Robert, you know, it was like, give me a call as soon as you got this message. The second time and then the third time and then the fourth time. And man, it was Andrea and all these calls that were coming in. And I says, whoa, I says, why is this girl wanting to talk to me? It's like she was at a point where she just emotionally fell apart. Now, I heard about the Bill Cosby allegations when um, Andrea came out on the, on the Toronto Sun. It's like her picture was posted on the, the front of the on, the, on the, on the very first page of the Toronto Sun. I was reading the article that, you know, it was like uh, Bill Cosby... Um, was being uh, accused for sexually molesting her. And, and um, I was sort of like saying, whoa, what is this about? After, you know, after I read the whole article and um, all I saw was, uh, this can't be, it's like, you know, it was like Andrea taking pills that, you know, she uh, knew nothing about. Andrea, Andrea would never take a pill unless she knew what it was, okay? Even if she trusted a person, I had the feeling it's like if I went, no matter how, even if her mother gave her a pill to take this, Andrea would want to, to read it, know what the pill was. Joanne, okay, um, when I was putting the pieces together, I found out that uh, Joanne hated black men. And when I was talking to her on the phone, she just like despised black men. And so I said, and she told me she doesn't want any black men inside the inside her house at all. Yeah, me personally, I think that uh, Joanne is the one who orchestrated this whole thing. Personally, I think she hates Andrea. I think that Andrea's mother is uh, is controlling Diana to speak a certain way to make Andrea look so bright and shiny that she's everybody's shining armor. And I think that Andrea is in for a major downfall. What do I have to gain? Not only peace of mind, but to get all these daggers out of my body and out of my mind. As I feel like I'm being directed, okay, to go up against the bad. And my relationship with Andrea, Andrea's mother and that whole family, they're just bad people. And I think I, this is what I have to gain, is that for the first time in my life, I have a chance to fight for the good. Because I don't believe Bill Cosby.